In 1987, 25-year-old Wendy Nell was living in Tunbridge Wells, Kent. She was very funny, spontaneous, and generous. She was not active in the nightlife scene, but loved to travel. She was independent and very hardworking. She worked managing a local Super Snaps, a shop that developed film on Camden Road. She was a very friendly boss who put her new employees at ease as she trained them. Wendy had been married, but the marriage ended amicably shortly before she began to work for Super Snaps in early 1985. She had transferred to the Camden Road location at the beginning of 1987, following a move to a bedsit in Guilford Road. Wendy spent June 21st celebrating her niece's fifth birthday. At the party, she told her family about the trip to Austria she had recently taken. She was about to take another trip to Paris with her boyfriend Ian, during which the couple planned to become engaged. The failure of her first marriage had not soured her on the institution, or taken away her desire to make a family home for herself and have children. Wendy spent the following evening with Ian at his mother's house. He gave her a ride home on his motorcycle, dropping her off around 11 p.m. He did not spend the night with her because he had to be at work early the next day. At her door, they briefly discussed their trip to Paris and kissed goodnight before Wendy went inside. The following day, one of Wendy's co-workers, Deborah, reported to work at the Super Snaps to find that Wendy had not arrived to open the shop. At 9 a.m., she was able to contact another co-worker who gave her Wendy's address. Deborah drove over to Wendy's flat and rang her doorbell several times, but Wendy did not answer the door. Her co-worker then called Wendy's mother, Pamela, to ask if she knew where Wendy was. Pamela, in turn, called the Maidstone and District Bus Company, where both her husband, Bill, and Wendy's boyfriend, Ian, worked, just before 11 a.m., after she could not reach her daughter by phone. Ian then drove over to Wendy's home. Like Deborah, he did not get an answer when he rang the doorbell, so he began pounding on the door and calling Wendy's name. When he still received no response from inside, he went around the back of the building, where there was a window in Wendy's room that could not be properly secured. Ian could see Wendy in her bed through the window. He could also see some blood. As Ian climbed into the room through the window, he yelled out for Wendy to wake up. Wendy was still not moving. Ian could not comprehend what had happened. He stroked her hair, pulled down her blanket, picked up her arm, and tried to pull up her eyelids in an effort to wake her up, his brain still not processing the fact that Wendy was dead. Ian climbed back out the window and ran to a nearby fire station for help, before sitting down and sobbing. In a 2012 statement, Ian said, Not a day goes by when I don't feel guilty about her death. If I'd stayed the night, she would be alive today. The day Wendy's body was found, June 23rd, was her father Bill's birthday. Wendy had been raped, beaten, and strangled. Just five months after Wendy was killed, another young woman from Tunbridge Wells was murdered. 20-year-old Caroline Pierce lived less than a mile away from Wendy. She also worked on Camden Road as a manager at a popular restaurant called Buster Brown's. Despite the proximity of their homes and the places where they worked, it is believed that the two women did not know each other. They may have seen each other in passing, however, as they both frequently ate lunch at the same cafe. Caroline spent the evening of November 24th, 1987, out with friends. A taxi dropped her off outside of her flat in Grosvenor Park shortly before midnight. Authorities do not believe she ever made it inside. Several of her neighbors reported hearing screams shortly after Caroline was dropped off by the taxi. One neighbor reported hearing a woman shout no multiple times, while others just heard shrieks. Several of these witnesses looked out their windows to try to see what was going on, but none of them saw the woman who was the source of the screams. Caroline was reported missing by her family the following day after she failed to report to work. She would not be located for three weeks. On December 15th, her body was found in an overgrown drainage ditch running through farmland in Romney Marsh, nearly 40 miles away from her home. She was only spotted because the man who found her had been driving a tractor, which put him up high enough to see her body down in the water-filled ditch. Based on the extent of the decomposition her body had undergone, authorities believed she was killed the night she was abducted. Caroline's body was found curled up in the fetal position, wearing only a pair of black tights. Authorities believed the tights had been put back on her body after she was killed, as her underwear was missing.
Caroline's handbag was located nearby, but the rest of the clothing she had been wearing the night she was abducted was never found. Like Wendy, Caroline had been raped, beaten, and strangled. Both Caroline and Wendy's keys were missing and never located. Both women had at least one distinctive keychain on their keyring. Reports of a peeping Tom around both victims' homes had been made in the months leading up to the murders and on the days when each woman was killed. A man had been seen looking into windows of residences near Wendy's the night she was killed and in the weeks previous. One of Wendy's neighbors, who lived two floors above her, reported seeing the same man looking into the windows of a building across the road up to three times a week for over a month. Eight weeks before her death, Caroline Pierce had locks fitted to her windows because she did not feel safe, and she filed a report about a prowler a month later, just weeks before she was killed. She had reported seeing a peeping Tom around her home to a former boyfriend. Based on the similarities between the two women's appearance, living situation, and causes of death, as well as the reports of prowlers nearby, the two murders were officially linked by the police. The crimes were dubbed the bedsit murders in the press, in reference to the one-room style of flat both the victims lived in at the time of their deaths. Investigators did have some forensic evidence they could use at the time, a bloody fingerprint found on a shopping bag in Wendy's bed, and a distinctive shoe print that did not match any shoes owned by Wendy or her loved ones, left on one of Wendy's blouses. There was also evidence that they did not have the technology to fully use in the investigation quite yet. DNA. Colin Pitchfork, the first individual convicted of murder based on DNA evidence, was arrested in September of 1987, after Wendy's murder and before Caroline's. However, it was still a novel technology in the legal system, and police in Kent did not have access to a large database of DNA samples to compare the DNA from the crime scene to at the time. While DNA was too new of a tool to be as useful as it is today, investigators did understand its value and preserved swabs and other DNA evidence accordingly. The case was featured twice on the BBC program Crime Watch over the years, with numerous tips called in following each episode. Police collected hundreds of DNA swabs from potential suspects, none of which proved to be a match to the DNA from the crime scene, and traveled to Australia and Canada to follow up on leads. Caroline's parents relocated, and they do not speak about their daughter's death publicly, although they were very supportive of the investigation. Wendy's parents spoke to the media about the pain the loss of their daughter had caused, and the strain it put on their relationship. They again spoke about their hope to finally catch the killer at a press conference on the 25th anniversary of the murders in 2012. Bill Nell died in 2017 after a battle with liver cancer, heartbroken over the lack of resolution in his daughter's case. His dying wish was for Wendy's killer to finally be found, even though he would not be alive to see the arrest. Investigators did their best to use the preserved DNA from the cases as advances in technology, as well as the law, provided them with more opportunities to do so. DNA would be found on swabs taken during Wendy's post-mortem examination, as well as her bedding and one of her towels. The DNA profile was run through the relatively new National Criminal Database in 1999, but no match was found. By 2019, available technology allowed for DNA to be extracted from the degraded semen sample found on Caroline's tights as well, providing authorities with further evidence connecting Caroline and Wendy's murders. However, there was still no match to the profile in the National Criminal Database. This led investigators to attempt to use the database in a slightly different way. The killer they were looking for had never been compelled to submit a DNA sample following an arrest but perhaps another member of his family had. They instead tried using familial DNA to identify potential relatives of Caroline and Wendy's killer in the database. Out of the 6.5 million DNA profiles in the national database, they were able to identify a few profiles with enough genetic similarity to indicate that they were related to the man responsible for the bedsit murders. These small number of individuals had a large number of relatives, so authorities began narrowing them down based on age and residence in 1987. The most promising profile from the database appeared to be a sibling of the killer, so this family was most closely scrutinized. The individual from the database had a brother named David Fuller, who had been in his early 30s and living in the next major town over from Tunbridge Wells in 1987. His DNA was never entered into the National Criminal Database, but only because his criminal behavior predated it. 
He first became known to police when he was still in school for stealing bicycles and setting fires, which resulted in property damage. In the 1970s, he committed a string of what the police called creeper burglaries. When police met with 66-year-old Fuller in 2020, he was living in Heathfield, West Sussex, with his third wife and their teenage son. He also had adult children from an earlier marriage. He told police during questioning that he had not been very familiar with Tunbridge Wells back in the 80s, and that he had never been to the Super Snaps or the Buster Brown's restaurant there. Fuller's fingerprints were taken, as well as a DNA sample. One of his fingerprints was a match to the fingerprint left at Wendy's crime scene. His DNA was a match to the DNA found at both Wendy and Caroline's crime scenes. Unfortunately for Fuller, police were also very quickly able to determine that he had lied to them during questioning. During a search of his home following his arrest, they found numerous pieces of evidence that tied him to Tunbridge Wells and to the murders. Fuller maintained detailed records of his daily life going back decades. In his home were piles of old computer hard drives, old invoices and daily diaries, over 2,000 obsolete digital storage drives, and more than 30,000 printed photographs. Sorting through these records, police found numerous invoices for work Fuller had done as an electrician in Tunbridge Wells, as well as diary entries showing he regularly ate at Buster Brown's, the restaurant where Caroline Pierce had worked as a manager. He was familiar with the street where Wendy had lived, because he had lived on it in the 1970s and early 80s, prior to her moving there. There were numerous photos of Fuller on rides with a cycling club back in the late 1980s. When investigators contacted other former members of this club, they reported that one of the group's cycling routes had gone through Romney Marsh, where Caroline's body had been found. Police also found a picture of Fuller sunning his back sometime in the 1980s. In the photo, the distinctive tread of his Clark's brand of shoes was visible, and the pattern of the tread was matched to the bloody footprint left on Wendy's blouse. Fuller was arrested at his home on December 3, 2020. In light of the DNA evidence, during a pre-trial review, he did admit that he was the person who killed both Wendy and Caroline, but he pled not guilty to murder on the grounds of diminished responsibility. He went to trial in the beginning of November 2021. However, on November 4th, the fourth day of his trial at Maidstone Crown Court, the now 67-year-old Fuller changed his plea to guilty. Following Fuller's change of plea, a statement from the Nell family was read outside the courthouse. Although the guilty plea won't change anything deep down, as the pain and loss will always be there, it's good to know he will not be in a position to hurt or cause any more pain, not just for our family, but for Caroline's family, and friends who have been on this same journey with us, and all the other families his life has affected. We feel a deep sadness for you all, the statement said in part. Unfortunately, as the Nell family's statement alluded to, the resolution of the two murder cases opened up a much larger investigation of a different but still horrifying nature. Most of the storage devices and records Fuller had spent the previous decades hoarding were in plain view when police searched his home. However, police also found a container holding four hard drives attached to the back of a cabinet. The cabinet had been pushed against a wall inside of a cupboard so that the container and the hard drives were hidden from view. According to prosecutor Duncan Atkinson, when these hard drives were examined, they were found to contain a library of unimaginable sexual depravity. The four hard drives contained five terabytes of data storage. They contained millions of images and videos taken by Fuller as he raped and sexually abused corpses in hospital morgues. Fuller had worked as a hospital electrician since 1989, starting out at the Kent and Sussex Hospital, and working there until it closed in September 2011. He then transferred to the Tunbridge Wells Hospital at Pembury, where he continued to work until his arrest in December of 2020. As an electrician, he had an all-access swipe card, which allowed him to enter the area of the hospital where autopsies were performed. According to records, he entered the autopsy area thousands of times. The swipe card system was designed to monitor for unusual access to the autopsy area, but the records appear to have never been checked. Fuller would have legitimate reasons for entering the autopsy area, 
like checking the temperatures of the refrigerators in them. And surveillance footage shows him carrying equipment he would have needed for such tasks around some of the times he is known to have committed his crimes, providing him with a cover story were another staff member to come across him in the autopsy area. Fuller was able to take advantage of the shift's work by different employees within the hospital. The five staff members in the mortuary normally worked from 8 a.m. until 4 p.m. Fuller's regular shift was from 11 a.m. until 7 p.m., giving him a three-hour window during which he was in the hospital, but the mortuary staff was not. Porters could bring bodies down at any time of day or night, but the refrigerators in which hospitals stored them could be opened from both ends. The porters would place bodies in the refrigerators, using the door from the main receiving area, and would then lock the door. Fuller would access the bodies from within the autopsy area, where no staff was usually present after 4 p.m., and the doors were not locked. There were CCTV cameras in the main receiving area, but not in the autopsy area itself, in an effort to show respect to the deceased individuals who were being autopsied there. Fuller bypassed the receiving area and its cameras by entering the autopsy area through utility areas. Over 100 women and three children, ranging in age from 9 to 100, were seen being abused in the images and videos found on the hard drives hidden in Fuller's home. Authorities were able to identify around 80 of them by the identification tags visible in the available images. Kent police have set up Operation Sandpiper, an effort to try to identify the remaining victims. Relatives who are concerned their loved ones may be one of these unidentified victims can contact Kent Police via the website or phone number listed on the screen. The Victim Support Service has provided a £1.5 million grant to notify and counsel the families of Fuller's victims. According to Detective Superintendent Ivan Beasley, the scale of this offending is unprecedented in the UK. There is nothing we have ever seen like this. The offenses documented in the files on the hard drives occurred between 2008 and November of 2020. This leaves a concerning 20-year gap between the murders of Caroline and Wendy and the offenses documented in Fuller's files. During the original investigation into Wendy's murder, it was determined that she had been raped on the point of death or after death, meaning that Fuller may have committed the murders to give him access to bodies rather than to cover up the rapes of living victims. Authorities are investigating the possibility that Fuller was committing offenses against the deceased throughout the years following Caroline and Wendy's murders. One of Fuller's victims was 24-year-old Azra Kamal, who worked as a researcher for Sky News. She was smart, strong, and dedicated to helping others. When one of Azra's friends was thrown out of her home by an abusive boyfriend, Azra's response was to go to the home and throw him out instead. Azra died after falling off of a bridge in July of 2020. She and another passenger had exited the car they were riding in after it caught fire. Azra fell 40 feet through a gap between the two sides of the A21 dual carriageway near Tonbridge in Kent as she was going for help. Azra's body was raped by Fuller three times, with the attacks occurring both before and after Azra's mother, Nevris, came to say goodbye to her daughter. So, whilst I'm stroking my daughter's hair, sleeping on her hair, a man had crawled all over her skin, and there's me kissing and cuddling and saying my last goodbyes. And that is quite awful. Quite awful. However, it is not Azra's shame. It is not my shame. Like women who are raped around the world, they have a voice. Azra has a voice. I am speaking out for my daughter, Ms. Kamal told Sky News. Ms. Kamal has been a vocal advocate for her daughter, calling for increased security measures and the resignation of the chief executive of the NHS Trust in light of the offenses that occurred under his watch. She has also raised concerns over the length of sentences offenses like those Fuller committed against her daughter receive under current law. During questioning following his arrest for Wendy and Caroline's murders and the discovery of the hard drives, Fuller admitted to the necrophilia he also acknowledged that he had researched some of his victims online, using sites like Facebook, after he assaulted them. He learned the names of these victims from their identification tags and mortuary logbooks. He logged their names and information in a notebook, as well as organized the images and videos of their assaults into files, sometimes by name, on his computer. 
In court, Fuller pled guilty to 32 individual counts of sexual penetration of a corpse, as well as a further group charge of sexual penetration of a corpse that represents 27 other victims. He further pled guilty to Section 63 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act of 2008, extreme pornography involving a dead body. While Fuller has not yet been sentenced, between the two murder charges and numerous necrophilia-related charges, he will certainly receive a lengthy sentence. However, Neveris Kamal and others have raised concerns over the sentencing guidelines for sexually abusing corpses. The maximum penalty for penetration of a dead body is two years imprisonment, while extreme pornography involving a dead body carries a sentence of three years. Ms. Kamal has called for a much clearer law prohibiting necrophilia and an increase in the amount of time in prison the law requires as punishment for it. Shortly after Fuller's guilty pleas, the health secretary announced an independent inquiry looking into his offenses and their national implications. It hopes to uncover how such offenses were committed without being noticed by the NHS for so long, and areas where future action will be needed. The report will be divided into two parts, with an interim report expected in early 2022 and the full report later in the year. Neveris Kamal will continue advocating for her daughter and working to ensure that an offender as prolific as Fuller will never again be allowed to operate without notice. I've tried to protect Azra all my life, and when she was really helpless, lying there, still being raped and abused, she couldn't scream out, couldn't call me, she couldn't call the police. But I will ensure her voice is heard, and that will be my mission, she told Sky News.